have been uh, given a nod. So let's get started. And uh, it sounds like I've cut out, a, cut out already, so let's just abandon this. Can you hear me okay at the back? Is that okay? Great. So today, hopefully, you're here to learn about Dplyr. And to give you a little bit of context, I'm interested in data manipulation in the context of data analysis. So you've got raw data coming in one side, understanding, knowledge, and insight coming out the other. And today we're going to be focusing on data manipulation, but I see this really as being part of the cycle of other data analysis or data science tools. So to me, there's really four main tools for data science. So the first is data tidying, getting your data into a form that's actually suitable for analysis. Now in this diagram, I've drawn this little short arrow, but as many of you have actually worked with real data, you know, often the arrow is all the way around on the other side of the room. <laughs> so often the, the, one of the most challenging parts of doing a data analysis is just getting the data in the right form that you can work with it. <coughs> now once you've done that, you'll often do some basic manipulation, data transformation. You'll create new variables that are functions of existing variables. You might do a little bit of aggregation and, and so on. And, that, and that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. But it's also important to bear in mind that you're doing this to fit into a cycle. You want your tools to easily plug into the other. You want your manipulation tools to easily plug into your data visualization and modeling tools. So visualizations are great because they uncover the unexpected. They help you make precise your questions about the data. But the problem with visualizations is that they fundamentally don't scale. On the other hand, the kind of complementary tools, statistical models, machine learning, data mining, Basically, whenever you've made a question sufficiently precise that you can answer it with a handful of summary statistics or an algorithm, you've got a model. Models are great because they scale, but they don't fundamentally surprise you. A linear model is never going to tell you your data is nonlinear. So in any real data analysis, you're going to be circling between these tools multiple times. You might start by looking at a plot. Based on that plot, you develop a model. You then take some predictions from that model. You transform your data to look at the residuals. You visualize those and so on and so on. So while today we're going to be focusing on data manipulation, data transformation, the goal is to have tools that embed seamlessly into your data analysis process. And so the, the, so the, the family of tools uh, that, I've been, that I've been working on and others at our studio are working on have, have recently sort of undergone somewhat of a, a change. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, I'm going to be talking about that in my talk on Tuesday. Um, but basically, uh, for data tidying, now the tidy R package, which is kind of another update of reshape and then reshape 2 and now tidy R. Plyr has become dplyr, and uh, ggplot is in the process of turning into ggplot2. And as you'll see today, um, there are some kind of very important commonalities that underlie all of these tools that make it easy for you to use them. So today we're going to talk about data manipulation. We'll start with a little intro to the data we're going to be using, then uh, talk about single table verbs, uh, a little bit about data pipelines, uh, some more complicated types of filtering and grouping, uh, joins, a very a general do operator, and then I'm just going to talk very briefly at the end about how the, all the tools you've learned today, working with data frames, also apply to databases as well. But before we begin, I, I kind of want to start with the caveat. And, and the bad news is whenever you're learning a new tool, for a long time you're going to suck. It's going to be very frustrating. Uh, but the good news is, that that is typical, it's something that happens to everyone, and it's only temporary. Unfortunately, there is no way to going from knowing nothing about a subject to going knowing something about a subject and being an expert in it without going through a period of uh, great frustration and uh, much suckiness. But remember, when you're getting frustrated, that's a good thing, that's typical, it's temporary. Keep pushing through, and then time will become second nature. Okay, with that said, let's get started. We're going to be looking at uh, four interrelated data sets today. I have given you them in a RStudio project. 
So if you have downloaded the code and data, you can double click on this rproj file. If you are not using RStudio, my apologies, but you can just change your working directory and I'll assume you'll be okay with that. So in this directory, we've got uh, the scripts, which mostly correspond to what we're going to be working through today. And then we have got four data sets. I wanted to start briefly with a couple of hints about using... Oh, I'm not going to do that. Okay, I'm going to tell you about the data. So we've got these four data sets. The first one is the main one I'm going to be looking at. This is not a huge data set, but it's reasonably sized. About 200,000 observations. This is every flight that departed from Houston in 2011. And then we have got three data sets that we can join with this data set that provide useful additional metadata. So we have some data about the weather for each hour. As you can imagine, uh, if we're looking at flight data, you might be interested in what causes flight delays. Uh, the weather is obviously a cause of that. You might also be interested in are there planes that are consistently delayed. So we have some information about the planes that are flying these routes, when they are built, what type of plane they are, how many people they seat, and so on. And then we have some information about the airports that the flights are flying to, which is mainly their location, so you can plot them on a map. Now, to load this data in, uh, I'm not going to talk to you about this code. It's there in the first uh, file. So to get started, you're going to want to source that file in. That is going to create these four data sets. The only thing that you might not have seen before is this table df function. What that is going to do, it's going to turn these data frames into dplyr as table df objects, which are almost identical in every single way to data frames, except when you print out a table df, it does not print out 10,000 rows. <laughs> it will only print out the first 10 rows. So it gives you some summary information about what's going on in that data set. It prints all the variables that fit in one screen. I might make this a little wider. And it, if you, they don't fit on the screen, it just gives you a little summary, the names of the variables and what type of variable they are. Yep? It's exactly, it's identical in every way to a data frame, except when you look at the class, it is one, well, two additional things. If, the, if a package doesn't know about dplyr, it will just treat it exactly like a data frame. And in fact, it is a data frame, it's just a special type of data frame. So we've got flights data, about 200,000 observations, weather, which is about 8,000, these planes, about 3,000, and then about uh, 3,000 airports. Okay, now that you've introduced yourselves and hopefully have some questions to ask about the data, we're going to dive in and learn the first uh, five important verbs associated with dplyr. So my kind of contention is, if you know these five verbs, and combine them with another tool we'll learn about shortly. This will solve 90% uh, say of your data manipulation problems and that's really important because now and when you have a data manipulation problem instead of thinking well there's like a thousand functions in base R which one of those is the one I need now you just need to look through these five verbs. So the first verb is filter where you're going to select rows based on the values of their variables you might also want to just focus on a certain number of columns or variables that select. You might want to reorder the rows or arrange the data frame. You might want to add new variables that are functions of existing variables. Or finally, you might want to reduce multiple values down to a single value. So all of these functions work exactly the same way. The first argument is always a data frame. The subsequent arguments uh, tell you what to do with that data frame and then they always return a data frame. So none of these functions modify in place so whenever you use them if you do want to modify your data frame you're going to have to assign the results. A lot of the times I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to run the code and kind of show you the result on screen and then throw it away. That's great for teaching but obviously when you're doing a real data analysis you actually want to save what you've done. 
to illustrate these, I'm going to start with a very simple uh, five row data frame, which I'm also going to uh, show on the slides. So filter allows you to select rows that match some criteria. So here we're going to say filter df, we want all, we want all the rows where color equals blue. So this is the input and this is the output. So if you've used subset before in base R, this is very, very similar. If you're looking to see if a value matches one of multiple values, you can use in. And then there's a whole set of other operators. The regular logic, the, regi the numerical comparison operator is greater than, greater than or equal to, so on and so on. Uh, not equal, equal, and member of the set. You might also want to use uh, the Boolean algebra, so or, and, and not, and exclusive or. So I'm just showing this here as a reference. Hopefully if you've used R a little bit, uh, you're familiar with these already. There are kind of two main things to be cautious of. When you're working with vectors, you want to use the single bar and the single ampersand. If you're working with scalars, if you're working with single numbers, like you're using an if statement, that's when you use the double bar or the double ampersand. But here we're going to be working with vectors of values, so we want to always use the single vertical bar or the single ampersand. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, very shortly. So what I want you guys to do is practice using filter by extracting uh, the flights that match these criteria. So first of all, all of the flights that went to San Francisco, all of the flights that were in January, or all flights that were delayed by more than an hour, or they departed between midnight and 5 a.m., or when the arrival delay was twice as much as the departure delay or greater. So I'll give you a few minutes. I'll circulate around and help you. Again, there's only one of me and there's a lot of you. So if you get stuck uh, on my behalf, please feel free to ask your neighbor for help. Okay, so let's have a go at how you might tackle this. So we wanted to find all the flights that went to SFI or Oakland. So you might start like this. So there's 2,800 that went to SFO. Now a common mistake when you're first using R, you would say I want the destination to equal San Francisco or Oakland. You do that, that's not going to work. So you either have to be very explicit and say destination equals SFO or destination equals Oakland, or use the in operator. So that's all of the flights that whose destination was San Francisco or Oakland. Okay. In January, uh, that's actually a tricky one. The easiest way to do that is, in this case I know the first flight was January 1st, so I can just say give me all the flights before uh, the 1st of February. That didn't work, surprisingly, so we might need to just... Oh, it's 2011, yeah, okay. So let's just see, I don't think we need that. So that gets us 18,000 flights in January. Again, between uh, midnight and 5 a.m., there are two ways you can write this. So probably you might have written this. All of the flights where hour is greater than or equal to zero and hour is less than or equal to five. With filter, you can also supply multiple arguments to it, and those arguments are all anded together. Uh, there's no real benefit to doing it this way rather than this way, uh, except maybe one day we might be able to figure out how to do these in parallel, and it might be <laughs> twice as fast if you do it this way. And then finally, all the flights delayed by more than an hour. Uh, there's two delay variables here, the departure delay and the arrival delay. Uh, I should have mentioned if it's a negative delay, that means it arrived uh, early or departed early. Uh, we can find all the flights that were delayed by more than an hour, right? 10,000 10, flights, if any of you have, I assume you've all flown in the US, 
so you're not surprised by this. <laughs> and we can also use more complicated expressions in there. We can find all of the flights where the arrival delay is twice as much as the departure delay. So these are cases where we have uh, lost time during the flight. Well, on these ones, we might also want to say, and the departure delay was greater than zero. Right, so this minute, this flight, I don't the logic right. Yeah, this flight was uh, two minutes delayed departing, and it was six minutes late on arrival. Any questions about filter? Yep? Uh, because it's faster, uh, because it is better defined, it just does one thing and it does one thing well, whereas subset does multiple things. And then finally, you can use filter on database tables and it will generate SQL for you. Will it work on regular data frames? Yes. Okay, the next verb is select, which allows you to pick variables you're interested in. So this is most useful if you have a data set that has hundreds of variables and you just want to look at a few of them. The syntax is the name of the data frame and then the a list of the variables you want to keep. So select works like the select argument to subset if you've ever used that. But basically you can treat the names of variables like their positions. So you can say use negative to say give me all of the variables that are not color. What I want you guys to do now is read the help for select. What are the other ways you can select sets of variables? And then see if you can come up with, as, well, three ways of selecting out the two delay variables from this data set. So if you look at the help for select, you'll see that uh, all of these main verbs are documented together and you'll See that I've been courteous to Americans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if we scroll down, we can see that there are five ways of, uh, well, at least five ways, extra ways of selecting variables. So you can select variables that start with a common prefix, that end with a common suffix, that contain uh, some character string, or that match a regular expression, or you can do like a numeric range to say all of like x1 to x10. So this is my attempt to kind of come up with every way that you might reasonably want to select a variable. So a couple of ways you can select these two. You can select them just as in individual variables. You could say pick all of the variables between from arrival delay to departure delay. You could find all of the variables that end with delay or all of the variables that contain delay. There's lots of other ways too. You could also write this. You could say make a vector of columns. We're using C. So basically inside select variable names, you can treat them like the numeric positions. So anything you can do to a numeric position, you can do with a variable name. So the goal with select is to make it easy to refer to your variables by name. It's always a better idea to refer to your variables by name than by position because you don't want your, if your data input format changes and you're referring to variables by position, it's very easy to have code that works but gives you meaningless results because it's using the wrong variables. The next verb is a range which just short changes the order of the rows, so uh, if you just use a bare variable, it orders it by that. You can order in descending order by using the des desk wrapper, and I uh, don't show you here, but you can add additional variables to break ties if there are ties in this first variable here. So again, order the flights uh, by departure date and time, figure out using a range which flights were most delayed, and then which flights caught up the most time during the flight. So again, a few minutes to work on this and I'll show you the answers. Okay, if we want to order the flights uh, by their departure date, we could say order it by date and then hour and then minute. Just want to see multiple, ordering by multiple variables. 
Uh, so you can see the first flight left on January 1st, one minute after midnight. So I should mention the, so this dip variable is the departure time as like a 24 hour time, but all the zeros got dropped off. Um, and then the hour and minute are just that, this time split up into those pieces. So for example, in this column, you know, there's, there's not going to be any six, there's not going to be a six, six, one. No, no flights left. It's 61 minutes past 6 a.m. This is just sort of a weird decimal time. If we want to sort, find the most delayed, that's just a matter of sorting so that our delays are descending. We can see the most delayed flight was 981 minutes. So an impressive uh, 16 hour delay. Now normally flights aren't delayed that long, uh, not because flights aren't delayed that long, but generally airlines cancel the flights to make their departure delay statistics look better. <laughs> so similarly we could do the same thing for arrival delay, which is going to give us a pretty similar message. And the other thing I wanted to show here is that you can arrange on kind of compound expressions. So I wanted to find the planes that are mode made up the most time that is the biggest difference between the departure and arrival delay. Uh, so these are flights So, for example, uh, this flight left one minute early and it arrived an hour and 10 minutes early. So you can arrange on compound expressions Although generally it's going to be easier to add that as a new variable so you can see what's going on and then arrange by that. Why are you ordering this descending? Because I wanted to find the one that I wanted to find the biggest difference. I may have. I may have um, had this round the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. So depending on which way around, yeah, whether you yeah, subtract yeah, yeah. arrival from departure versus descending or ascending. Any other questions about a range? It was, I had a problem with DNA. The first time I did something, I got all DNAs on top. But I did it in a different way that you did, but once I... Uh, so NAs should always sort to the end, and if they don't, that, that's a bug. <laughs> they do, but what if I want the smallest uh, without the NAs? Uh, you have to use filters to remove the NAs. Current and then. Yeah. Is there an opposite of descending? Yes, just don't do descending. <laughs> uh, I think also the way that uh, I believe that if you descend, do descending on descending, <laughs> that is async. <laughs> <laughs> If you really want an ascending function, you can just do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the kind of getting as we the starting to get more complicated, the next verb is mutate, which add, allows you to add new variables that are functions of existing variables. So here we're adding a new variable called double, which is two times our existing value variable. So again, in all of the dplyr functions, you never need to explicitly refer to the data frame that you're working with. That's always implicit. It's going to look for this value inside the data frame rather than in your global environment. Uh, mutate is very similar to transform in base R if you've used that. One big difference with mutate is you can do uh, multiple, you can, in, in additional mutations, additional transformations, you can refer to variables that you just created, which you cannot do in transform and is uh, a little bit annoying. So here we first double value, and then we make a new co column called quadruple, which is just two times double a variable we just created. Yep. How does it compare to within? Uh, basically, I think within is a hideous monstrosity that no one should ever use. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to know more, I can tell you after class. Okay, so your turn to create some variables. Uh, see if you can figure out the speed in miles per hour, uh, which flight flew the fastest. See if you can create a new variable that shows how much time was made up during the course of the flight or lost. 
and then how did I compute the hour and minute variables from that departure variable? Okay, so if I wanted to compute the speed, that is just the distance divided by the time divided by 60, because time is in minutes. Uh, so if we print that out, you know, unless you make your screen really wide, you can't see everything. So one thing you can do is use the view function, uh, which is a, works in R Studio and, and other R IDEs, that will just, which will just show all of the, your variables in a nice kind of scrollable table, or you can always just select the variables you want to see. So from like departure to speed, so. But views a very handy way of just viewing a data frame in a nice table. Um, did you change flights? Yes, yeah, so in this oh, yeah, case, yeah, yeah, yeah. I modified flights because I wanted to create a new variable and modify that original data set to add that new variable, and then I can uh, sort it to find the fastest ones. And uh, see, 760 miles an hour. Yep. When you mutate, um, is there an easy way to specify a position of where you want to put that? No, so when you, mute, when you add new variables, they always go to onto the end of the data frame. If you wanted to reposition them, there's currently no particularly easy way to do that. You could create a big select statement, but it's kind of pain. We could create this delta variable, which is just the difference between the departure and arrival delay. You know, if you didn't care about the direction, you could, you know, you can do any, whatever you want in this, whatever our expression you want. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, it's just a useful trick. Uh, if I have this departure, where the first two digits are the hour and the second two digits are the minute, uh, you can use the integer division operator and the modulo operator to extract those pieces out. This is just a useful little uh, trick if you have, want to pull out certain digits from a uh, long number. Any other questions about uh, mutate? Okay, next I want to talk about a uh, new function, group by and summarize together. You can use summarize in regular data frames, but you always get a data frame that is only one row, which is typically not very useful. So, well, and that's exactly what I said. So summarize <laughs> is going to give you a one row data frame. What you're going to want to do is actually group your data first, and then summarize will operate by group. So here we're saying create a new uh, data frame, which is this old data frame grouped by color. And then we're going to summarize this. And for each group, compute the total by summing up the value variable. So I'm going to create four useful ways of grouping the flights data. We might want to group it by date. We might want to group it by hour. We might want to group it by plane or we might want to group it by destination. Now one thing to bear in mind when you do create all these, these uh, groupings, dplyr is sort of smart enough that it doesn't create a complete copy of your data every single time. It works the same way as the rest of R, it does it in sort of a lazy way. If you modify one of these data sets, it will have to create a copy, but until you do so, they all point to the same place. So grouping data doesn't, doesn't use up it doesn't create a copy of the data. It does use up a little bit more uh, memory because grouping builds up an index so you know what observations are in each group. Now there are lots of summary functions you can use. Uh, most of these are pretty standard. R, uh, minimum, medium, maximum. You can extract quantiles. Uh, there are two functions that are special in dplyr in which just tells you how many observations are in a group. Indistinct, and I should have a uh, X there, tells you how many different observations are in a variable. That's the same way, same as doing length unique X, but it's a little bit more efficient. You can sum, you can compute means. Uh, it's also often useful to do summaries of logical vectors. 
because when you take a logical vector and treat it like it's a numeric, all the falses turn into zeros and the trues turn into ones. So what that means is when you sum a logical vector, it tells you how many trues there were. So this would tell you how many values of x are greater than 10. The mean is just the sum divided by the length. So the mean of a logical vector is the proportion of values that are true. These are really useful little uh, tip tricks. And then lots of other ways of me measuring the variation, standard deviation, variance, interquartile range, median, absolute deviation, and so on. So these are all just standard R functions. I think IQR is capitalized. Yeah, I think it's capitalized. Okay, what I want you guys, what I've shown here is the distribution of departure delays. So I've got two views of this, one which shows all of the delays and one which just shows the delays less than like two hours. So what I want you to do with your neighbor for two minutes is just quickly brainstorm, given this distribution, given what you know about flight delays, how might you want to summarize this distribution? What function might what you want to use? Would you want to use a mean or a median or something else? So take two minutes. Starting now, talk it over with your neighbor. So we're going to summarize by date. What's one way we could use to summarize the distribution of, depart of delays? The median? We could use the median. Uh, we probably want to use the departure delay. So if we just run that, We are going to get a new data frame. It has 365 rows, which you should have anticipated. You know how many days there are in a year. Uh, got one little problem here. Probably want to use na.rm <laughs> equals true. Let's do that. How else could we summarize it? The mean's another obvious one. Let's just assume we've got that. What else might you want to see? 90% quantile. 90% quantile. Okay, we've got max. And actually typing all of this na.rm.true is going to get tedious real fast. So I'm just going to filter it and I say I want all of the ones that are not missing. Okay. So that way I can just drop this off and... Uh, I'll bother typing it. So that's the median, the mean, the maximum, and then something in between. We could get the uh, 90th quantile. I remember how to use that function. Any other ideas? Is there another? Is there a way to, to for example, compute more than just the 90% quantile? If I wanted to have, say, five different quantiles, do I have to type them uh, in? Currently, you have to type them in like this. Yeah. But uh, there will be some way in the future that lets you do that. I want to split my time. How long I was delayed? Yeah, we could also do like some thresholds, right? We could say, well, well, first of all, we could say, actually, just what's the proportion that are delayed? Right, so that is the average of all of the ones where the delay is greater than zero. So that is uh, depressingly high. But you might say, well, who really cares if it's only a, you know, a five minute delay or a 10 minute delay? I might just say arbitrarily, like a 15 minute delay, that's not bad. Why are we looking at departure, not arrival? Isn't yeah, so equally you might, uh, you might say, well, it's, it might be better to think about the impact on our arrival. That, that's what really matters, because that's someone's picking, up up, picking us up at the airport and our flight is now delayed by an hour and they're getting angry. So we could switch all this to arrival delay too, and the results are pretty similar. So 15 minutes is kind of arbitrary. You know, you could look at a, a few other ones if you wanted to do that. Question? Yes? Uh, is there any way we can use this summary function step? The which function? Summary uh, you could, but I'm not sure that you would want to. Um, so current, well, so there's, so there's two problems. So first of all, 
Uh, I mean, this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, currently, though, summarize everything. Every when you summarize, you have to reduce to a single number, not multiple numbers. Again, a future version of dplyr will let you summarize multiple numbers at some point in the future. Uh, what did I do? So this is what I did, and uh, you have to have na.rm everywhere, or you can filter out all of the flights that are not missing, that don't have missing departure delays. Oops. So, and this kind of brings me to my next point. In any like in any real data manipulation task. You're probably not just going to use one verb, but you're going to string multiple verbs together. First of all, we group it, then we filter it, then we summarize it. And we want some way to kind of express that more naturally or more simply, which is the, the idea of having a data pipeline. So what I want you to do quickly, uh, just take a minute, talk this over with your neighbor. What does this, co what does this snippet of code do? <laughs> so you've got one minute. Starting now. Okay, so this looks pretty complicated, but if you kind of really carefully pass it, you have to start from the innermost thing, right? We're going to start with the flights data, then we're going to filter it to remove any missing delays, then we're going to group it by date and hour, then we're going to summarize it to compute the average delay and the number of observations in that hour, then we're going to filter it to only look at the hours that have more than 10 flights. Right, so it's not too complicated, but we have to read it in a quite an unnatural way. We have to read inside out, and then also like the arguments to filter are quite far away. So instead, uh, what we're going to talk about after the coffee break is this pipe operator, and you'll see that that makes the code quite a lot easier to read. So the coffee is outside now. Uh, so let's have a coffee break and come back at uh, 3.40. Cool. Yeah. ...about this, uh, this operator called the pipe operator. So what this basically does is take the thing on the left hand side of the, the pipe and put it as the first argument as a thing on the right hand side. And the advantage of this is it allows us to take something like this, which is pretty hard to read, and transform it into something like this. And this is pretty easy to read, particularly if you pronounce this operator as then. So we can read this, take flights, then filter it to remove any values with a missing value for depth delay, then group it by date and hour, then summarize it, computing the, del the average delay and the number of observations in the group, then filter it to look at all of the, uh, the, ob the, ver the observations where n is greater than 10. So this pipe operator allows us to uh, form chains of complicated uh, data transformation operations that are made up of very simple pieces. So the goal is you make something complex by joining together many simple things that are easy to understand in isolation. So I want to give you some practice using that with uh, these three challenges. So which destinations have the highest average delays? Which flights happen every day and where do they fly to? And then on average, how do delays vary over the course of a day? And if you're going to do that, probably look at the non-cancelled flights. So <coughs> those, these three challenges, they're relatively simple. But you need to string together multiple of these verbs we've seen before. You might have to use a range and group by and summarize and filter in some order. So have a go at joining those together. And again, if you get stuck, I'll come around and help you out. Or better, ask your neighbor. <laughs> do. Well, we start with the flights. Filter. What are we going to do to that? Filter to remove NAs. Yep, we can remove the NAs. Let's do uh, rival delays. What next? Group by. group by. Group by. So group by is kind of a fundamentally like statistical operator. You're saying what is the unit of interest in this analysis? And in this case, it's the destination of the flight. 
Then for each destination, what we want to do is summarize it. I'm just going to say, let's use the mean delay. The other thing I think you always want to do whenever you do a group-wise summary is you always want to record the number of observations in each group. Because when you start looking at these averages, you know, if there's a destination that is the highest, has the highest average delay, but only one flight flew there, then that's probably not as interesting. And then if we want to focus on the most delayed flights, we're going to arrange it in descending mean. So let's run this. It worked. So you can see this is a good example. So there's this airport uh, BPT, which... Uh, let's see, I think I've Googled this before. So that is Jack Brooks, Brooks Regional Airport in uh, oh, near Port Arthur, Texas. So there are only three flights flew there the entire year. You're not going to trust this average that much. So we might, what we might want to do is uh, filter out all of the flights where there's less than 10 observations. And we'll run that pipeline again. Now again, like I've just, I've constructed this pipeline uh, just by typing every step and it worked, uh, which I have to say I'm slightly amazed at. But you know, generally when you're creating pipelines, you want to do it a step at a time. And this is one reason that I think this, this, the default printing is really important because you can just print out the result at every stage and you can see, does that look right or not? If you have a normal data frame, it will print all of it, right? Yes. Okay. So if you have a normal data frame, uh, it will print the whole thing. If you want to turn, uh, you can use a, like, if you have, you can always take a normal data frame and the first thing you can do on a pipe is pipe it into table DF <coughs> yeah. and turn it into a data frame. The other thing at, at table DF, the other thing that's useful is you might often pipe, you could pipe this into something rather than just printing it, you could pipe it into view oh. if you wanted to see more of the rec more of the data. That's kind of interesting. Uh, if you wanted to just kind of step through it, you could do talk about, you could do something like this, <coughs> maybe, which, so we're just taking the row number and taking a modulo 5 equals 0, so that's going to give us every fifth. That would be one way to do it. Um, so if you... View currently shows you everything. Well, it shows you the first so many rows. Uh, in the future, I think we'll make it so it shows every row in, in a way that's reasonably efficient. Uh, the other thing that's useful is to pipe it to STR so you can see exactly what variables you've created and if they're the right type and so on, or if you're so inclined um, could you, not. Could you put in two functions, like head and tail, after each other? Uh, so you, you can't. Basically, so you, you want a pipeline that has a split in it, right? You want to have a pipeline that one pipe goes to head and the other pipe goes to tail. No, actually, Both I want to show head and tail. Oh, at the same time, yeah. yeah I don't, uh, I don't like a data table does that by default, and I think that's a nice idea. Uh, the reason dplyr doesn't do it is because you can do that for data frames, but you can't in general do that efficiently for database queries. So um, you can always use tail or. So there's another handy keyboard shortcut in R Studio, which I suspect no one knows about because the only reason I know about it is the Joe who added it told me about it. There's this command called rerun previous. Oh. Has anyone used rerun previous before? <laughs> so what that does is if you've selected a block of code and pressed command enter, now if I modify it, it's kind of annoying I have to select that block of code again. Or you can press Command Shift P and it just sends those same lines of code into the R console. So this is really useful if you want to iterate rapidly on your pipeline. You can easily change things and maybe I want it in ascending order and just Command Shift P and rerun the whole pipeline.
Okay. So any questions about that pipeline that we created to solve that problem? So the next one is which flights happen every day and where do they fly to? No. So what are we going to start with with that? We want to find which flights fly every day of the year. What's probably the first thing we want to do? We want to group by. And uh, we want to do that by carrier and the flight number. Now we want to find all flights that flew every day of the year. Uh, any ideas? So we're going to summarize. What might we summarize? We might use the dates. What? How? Well, we're probably going to use the date. How? What are we going to do with that? Wait, 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 count at that point. Oh, so we could do we could do count. Flights. Flights. We could do count, and then we could filter by. Let's give us a name. Three sixty-five. And I forgot to put two equals. Now the problem with this is that it's possible. This flight flew um, twice. twice on one day and didn't fly at all on another day. Oh. I, I feel like that's, yeah, so actually this is my solution too. But now I think a better way would be to say, count the number of distinct dates. Oh. So if there's 365 distinct dates, then we know it's flown every day. I think this will give us a slightly different answer. Well, in this case, it gives us the same answer because there aren't flights that fly every day and then um, fly twice on one day, but not on another. Now, what if we wanted to add, see what destinations these flights flew to? Any thoughts on that? Can you just add it in the group by? We can just add it in the group by. Right, there are <coughs> other ways we could do this, which see later but in this case it's easy enough to just add that into the group by and see uh, Honolulu and uh, a lot of flights to New York and Chicago and Seattle and Miami I think and the last one on average how do delays of non-cancelled flights vary over the course of the day so again so first of all, we want to say they're not cancelled, which I think is cancelled equals zero. Cancelled is, has sort of a reason code associated with it. And then normally once you've kind of filtered out clearly wrong things, the first step is going to be grouping it. Here we want to group by hour, say, or maybe hour and minute. And then summarize, again, we want to count how many observations are in each group so we can disregard the delayed flights. Then we could do the mean. Departure delay. And uh, <laughs> summarize, not summary. Okay. So now when you get to this point, it starts to get easier to see what's going on with the visualization. So uh, this is basically that pipeline I just showed you. I think I've done it, I might have done it slightly differently. I created a new variable called time, which is just hour plus minute divided by 60. That gives me like a floating point number that smoothly varies over the course of the day. Group it, summarize it, and then I'm going to do a little ggplot2. Plot it. So you can see very early in the day we have this kind of scattered cloud of some plots that are very, very delayed. What might what might these be? They're the ones from the end of the previous night. They're the ones from the end of the previous night, and why are the averages so high, so variable? If we look at those, well we just scroll up here. These are the ones that have hardly any data. 
right? There are hardly any flights leave after midnight. So these averages are kind of suspicious. We're not really seeing much of a pattern. We're just seeing individual flights that were delayed a really long time from the previous day. So we might uh, want to, so one way we could show that in a visualization is to make the points proportional to the size, the number of observations, or we could uh, filter it and add some other stuff. So there's no schedule flights at the time of the day. Exactly, there's no schedule flights, yeah. So there's, there's some kind of interesting pattern going on here, uh, which I don't really understand. It's possible it's an artifact, but it looks like I added these line, white lines on every hour, but it looks like there's some kind of pattern where they, they start off, like delays kind of accumulate over the course of the day, but there's also some weird pattern within the hour where they accumulate and then they drop back a little, which I don't know what's going on. But certainly the suggestion is if you want to leave on time, fly early in the day. <laughs> <laughs> or late in the hour. Yeah. Or late in the hour, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about those pipelines in general or how you can combine these pieces with a pipe operator? Yep. Range is generally what the advantage is to, I mean, that's, that's the advantage to chaining versus having, you know, a ton of parentheses inside, inside. It's just easier to read. The, okay, the, so the sole the example is that it makes it easier for you to read it and understand what's going on. Is there any advantage of just having it you know, line by line? Like no. Uh, no, basically no. It'll save a little bit of memory, but it's not. Uh, so yeah, if the, in all the versions of dplyr used uh, percent dot percent. So if uh, now I prefer percent greater than percent for two reasons. First of all, it's easy to type because you can hold your finger on the shift button the whole time. And secondly, I think it's 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 not a symmetric operation. So having a an asymmetric operator helps you understand what's going on. The data is flowing from left to right. Any other questions here? Yeah. Is there a particular preferred order of filtering versus data versus uh, No, obviously the less data you have to work with, the faster things are going to be. So that generally suggests you should filter early on. And you know, so if you use a database, a database looks at the sequence of all the operations and says, oh, you did this filter at the end, but it would actually be way more efficient to do that at the beginning dplyr doesn't do anything like that. dplyr executes it exactly as you give it. So if you if you can think of a faster way to order the operations, it might be worthwhile uh, to do so. Generally, and I'm not really going to talk about performance today, but generally, uh, if you've got million like less than 10 million observations, you won't even have to worry about the performance. It's going to be a few seconds, and it's not like it's a waste of time worrying about it because you, it's not going to take you that long. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about... Uh,